Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rosemary Benales, U.S. Access Board, Washington, D.C. Today's program is about to begin. Please note that this session will be recorded. To display captions, select the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen. American Sign Language is also provided. And the PowerPoint presentation file is available for download at www.access-board.gov forward slash AV. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rosemary. And welcome to the United States Access Board's public forum on inclusive design of autonomous vehicles. Um, I'm Greg Furrybach, and I am honored to be the chairman of the U.S. Access Board. And uh, on behalf of all of our board members, we appreciate each and every one of you joining us today for what we hope will be a very exciting and novel uh, presentation. The Access Board is a small federal agency, but it has a very big mission, defining what accessibility means in terms of design. We do this by setting accessibility guidelines and standards for the built environment, transportation vehicles and systems, information and communications, technology, as well as medical diagnostic equipment. And all of these issues fall under the landmark Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and all other appropriate laws. In fulfilling this important mission, the uh, US Access Board works closely with many of our other agencies, including the United States Department of Transportation. Today, uh, I have the distinct honor and pleasure of opening our program with a message from a very dear friend of mine and a fellow Hoosier, uh, both of us from the great state of Indiana. It is my pleasure at this time to share with you a video message from President Biden's newly appointed Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. Well, greetings to Chair Farabach, to members of the U.S. Access Board, and to everyone joining today's forum. I really appreciate the opportunity to join virtually and help kick off this important discussion. I want to thank Greg, my friend and a fellow Hoosier, for inviting me to join for these opening remarks and for your leadership in the cause of equity and accessibility for all. And it's great seeing that so many good friends from Indiana are involved in this convening. I'm sorry that I can't join in real time for today's event, but I've asked a senior member of my team, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety Policy, Robin Hutchison, to be with you today. She'll be offering remarks, and I think that you'll really enjoy hearing what she has to say. The U.S. Access Board and the U.S. Department of Transportation have a long history of collaborating to make the transportation system safer, more equitable, and more accessible for all. Safety is our number one priority and making vehicles and infrastructure safe and accessible to people with disabilities benefits all Americans. I believe that transportation policy, when done right, makes the American dream possible by getting people and goods to where they need to be and directly and indirectly creating good paying jobs. But I also recognize all of the ways in which misguided policies and missed opportunities have sometimes reinforced racial and economic inequality, dividing or isolating neighborhoods, and undermining government's basic role of empowering Americans to thrive. Now, the disability community has done extraordinary work for generations to eliminate barriers to safety and prosperity for Americans with disabilities who rely on equitable access to transportation resources. And tearing down these barriers doesn't just benefit those who need accommodations, it benefits the entire country by unlocking the contributions that Americans with disabilities can make to our economy, to their families, and to society when transportation inequity no longer stands in the way. You and I know that there is so much work to do. There are also new tools on the horizon to help. The possibility of new national investments in transportation equity and the arrival of new technologies that can potentially be a major boost to equity. But that only happens if we make sure of it. And I know that's part of what you're convening to discuss today. We have an opportunity to incorporate access, equity, and accessibility for all from the beginning 
of our coming major policy and technology decisions. This is part of what it means to build back better and to include everyone in the future of innovation and the future of America. I hope that you have a fruitful dialogue at this important forum, and I'm looking forward to working with you to make transportation and our whole society more inclusive, more equitable, and more accessible for all. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the United States Access Board, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, Secretary Buttigieg, and I'll uh, use the term with you in Indiana, uh, Secretary Pete, uh, for his uh, gracious and kind remarks and taking the time to create that uh, uh, wonderful presentation. It's a great way to start off our tenure together, and we look forward to excellent and fruitful uh, conversation and, most importantly, results. Uh, Secretary Buttigieg sent with today uh, where Robin Hutchison, who serves as his secretary, his deputy assistant secretary for safety and policy uh, at the Department of Transportation. Uh, before her recent appointment to, to this position, uh, she was the director of public works for the city of Minneapolis and uh, previously served as transportation director for the city of uh, Salt Lake. Robin, thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Chair Farabach. And uh, I want to thank Secretary Buttigieg for taking the time out to record that video, even if you couldn't be here in person. I am uh, very excited to help kick off today's public dialogue on inclusive design of autonomous vehicles. And I very much appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. We are at the beginning of our administration and the work ahead. And we have um, an incredible opportunity to rethink, reshape, our partnerships to be sure that we are emphasizing what's most important, accessibility, safety, equity. So our work together is, it's a priority and I'm so pleased to be here with you today. I wanna to build a little off of what uh, Secretary Buttigieg and Chair Furbach said in their remarks that equal access to opportunity, including employment, education, healthcare, housing, community living, it really begins with accessible transportation. And nearly 57 million people in the United States have a disability. And while I don't need to tell you that, you know, as experts in your field, that that is true. Since the 30 years of the enactment of ADA, we must continue to make progress so that every one of those 57 million people are served by accessibility that they deserve. So the COVID-19 pandemic it's exposed and exacerbated some very severe and pervasive health and social inequities in America. It's been a difficult spotlight and it's been a little bit of a reckoning. People of color experience systemic and structural racism, more likely to become sick and die from COVID. And those living with disabilities and living at the margins of our economy, they're also disproportionately affected by COVID. And it's this spotlight that allows us to take a moment, self-reflect on our industry, our transportation industry, look at our role, and then be all in on supporting President Biden's infrastructure priorities to build back better. Because we need to talk about how transportation innovation can improve safety, efficiency, equity, including accessibility for all, for all. I know that Secretary Buttigieg is very committed to making sure that the department's stakeholder engagement efforts include people with disabilities in this important conversation. As the secretary said, safety is our number one priority. I don't think that um, uh, before my time, anyone actually held a title that was called uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Safety Policy. And it's a nod that brings safety right up to the forefront. Safe travel for everybody is our top we are working towards a comprehensive approach that will protect our most vulnerable users of our transportation system and support all of our goals. Making vehicles and infrastructure safe and accessible to everyone, and most importantly, making vehicles and infrastructure safe for people with disabilities from the outset, it's so critical. <clears throat> it's so critical because I believe you have so much to gain. We have so much to gain if we do so. 
Technology is only valuable if it's serving our goals. And we're hearing so much about autonomy and the promise of the autonomous vehicle. Well, I don't disagree, there's a lot of promise in autonomy and there's a lot of promise in using this technology. It really only works if we match it to our goals. And if our goals are to create a safe and accessible transportation system for everyone, then our vehicles and our technology has got to match to that. We start with the goal and then we invite the technology to partner for our goals. I really look forward to the rest of this conversation today. I'm actually able to stay on uh, for um, most of this today, and I, I'm just really looking forward to, to hearing more. And I'm also looking forward to participating with you um, over, you know, a longer, a longer period of time. I want to thank everyone who's participating today, our partnerships with our sister agencies who are here, and uh, just I'm looking forward to continuing the long tradition of collaboration between the U.S. Access Board and the U.S. Department of Transportation. So with that, I'll hand it back to Chair Farabach and just thank you once again, and I look forward to getting into the agenda. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Hutchinson. We uh, excellent remarks, and we, we're greatly uh, thankful that you are able to be a part of this program, and especially staying with us uh, as we uh, move through the afternoon uh, with all the good information uh, and quality thought that's going to be shared. Today's event is the first in a series of four virtual meetings on design and designing autonomous vehicles that are inclusive for everyone. Self-driving cars, shuttles, and other vehicles stand to revolutionize transportation. These vehicles can also open up a whole new world of transportation for people with disabilities, but only if they are able to get into and out of them to use them. These include people who use wheelchairs and are other mobility aids or have low vision impairments or are deaf or hard of hearing or who have cognitive disabilities. As with any technology or innovation, it is critical that the inclusivity is integrated, is integrated into design and development from the very beginning. Our discussion today is focused on advancing our understanding of what makes AVs accessible to everyone. The goal is to collect, share, and advance information on design considerations and solutions to ensure that AVs leave no one behind. Please note, and this is important, the Access Board is not undertaking rulemaking on AVs at this time. The board is conducting these sessions solely for the purpose of exchanging facts and information and ideas about accessible design of AVs, AVs to hear their thoughts from individuals on, big, on this very big undertaking. And we are thankful to be joined in this effort by our partners at the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy and Administration for Community Living at the Department of Health and Human Services and other agencies. Our focus in this first session is on accessibility for passengers with mobility disabilities in entering and exiting vehicles. We will begin with a presentation by Randall Deshaux, an accessibility specialist at the Access Board, who will review these key provisions in the guidelines for transportation vehicles that the Access Board is undertaking under the rules of the ADA. Note that we are not addressing how these guidelines may apply to various classes of vehicles under the ADA. That's a question within the purview of other agencies, notably the Department of Transportation. Instead, we will focus on how the board's ADA vehicle guidelines can be used as a resource for accessibility for AVs. In addition to several uh, other people, we have invited speakers, and they include Dr. Victor Puket of the University of Buffalo, who will discuss the results of AV accessibility. He will be followed by Amy Shupman of the National Mobility Equipment Dealers Association and Kevin Frayne of Braun Mobility, who will cover access solutions 
for en entering and exiting the vehicles. After that, we will turn it over to you for an open and what we know and will be an engaging and enlightening conversation. Today's event will be followed by sessions on mobility access aboard vehicles uh, on March 24th, the access for passengers with sensory or cognitive disabilities on April 27th and on April 21st. Our final note on this forum, our speakers have been invited to share information related to the accessible designs of AVs. However, their inclusion in this panel does not constitute an endorsement by the Access Board or any of our federal agencies uh, who are our partners of any product, service, organization, or technical solution. Thank you for being a part of this conversation today. And we look forward to everyone's participation. I'm now pleased to turn it over to Randall to begin the next segment of the conversation. Randall. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you for introducing our presenters today. We will also have a brief question and answer period after the presentations from University at Buffalo and Braun Ability. After the presentation portion of the event, we will move on to the open dialogue where attendees will be able to share information and make comments. After today's event has concluded, the public dialogue continues online at transportationinnovation.ideascale.com. If you have not already done so, please register to contribute ideas and comments. Also, this PowerPoint presentation is available to download on our website if you prefer to follow along with your own copy. Slide four. There are three ways you can participate in today's event. First, we encourage you to ask our presenters questions at any time during the event. You don't need to wait until the end of a presentation to ask a question. Please submit questions using Zoom's Q&A feature, which you will find on the toolbar below. As the moderator, I will read your question and give the relevant presenter a chance to respond. If you are unable to use the Q&A feature or have called them by phone, please email your question to events at sign access-board.gov. Another way you can participate in today's event is by contributing to the open discussion portion. If you would like to speak, use the Q&A feature to indicate your interest. Please note your name, organization, and the nature or subject of your comment. We will call on you in turn and enable you to unmute your audio. Just like with questions, feel free to submit your request to speak at any time during the event. You don't need to wait until we are officially in the open discussion portion of the event. If you have been queued up to speak, the host will send you a message via the chat letting you know ahead of time and will enable your microphone. I will then announce when it's your turn to unmute yourself and speak. If you wish to be visible for signing, please indicate so in your request. We have many people joining us today who are very interested in the subject, and I want to apologize in advance to those who may not get an opportunity today due to time constraints. However, there is another way to share information, ideas, and comments that we encourage you to use. We are hosting a companion online discussion platform provided by the Office of Disability and Employment Policy. It is open now at transportationinnovation.ideascale.com, and we'll provide further details later on in the program. Slide five. This event is entitled Inclusive Design of Autonomous Vehicles, and that's where we'd like to get to. But we'll begin by getting everyone on the same page with some of the minimum accessibility requirements that have already been established by the US Access Board that pertain to transportation vehicles, such as buses and vans. You will hear more about inclusive design from some of our other speakers during this series, but I just wanted to let you know that inclusive design exceeds the minimum accessibility requirements I will be talking about. This series is also focused on autonomous vehicles. And while our guidelines have been written in general for vehicles, autonomous vehicles are a subset of vehicles, but with some added complexities. We'll be focusing on level five autonomy, which is essentially a driverless vehicle. These vehicles do not require an occupant to be able to drive and may have non-traditional designs without a steering wheel or pedals. Driverless vehicles introduce several complexities related to entering and exiting vehicles for people with mobility disabilities. The existing, federal, the existing vehicle guidelines do not consider tasks a vehicle would have to perform if there was no driver, but nevertheless, they are a good baseline for starting the conversation. 
One other thing I'd like to point out is electric vehicles. While it seems that many autonomous vehicles are also electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles do not have to be electric. Accessibility should really be indifferent to whether a vehicle is electric or not, but design requirements could indirectly affect accessibility. For example, the location of batteries in the floor can impact vehicle height, vertical clearance, and ramp slopes. With these things in mind, let's move on to the minimum accessibility guidelines. Next page. The AD accessibility guidelines for transportation vehicles were finalized in 1991 and updated in 1998 to include over the road buses. Since then, we have updated the guidelines for buses and vans. These updated guidelines were finalized by the Access Board in 2016 and links to this content can be found on this slide and on our website. We provide technical assistance on these guidelines. So if you have any questions or want more information, please email us at ta at sign access board.gov. Slide seven. Today, I will give a high level technical presentation that briefly covers the accessibility guidelines for buses and vans. Again, my name is Randall Duchesneau and I'm an accessibility specialist with the US Access Board. Next slide. The requirements for entering and exiting vehicles could basically be summarized as providing at least one accessible means of getting on and getting off, which we refer to as boarding and alighting. This can be achieved using a ramp or bridge plate, lift or level boarding. At least one means must be able to deploy to the roadway. This is particularly important to allow a person using a mobility device to enter or exit the vehicle where there is no curb or level boarding platform and during an emergency. There are several technical criteria that we will touch on briefly, and these include everything from walking surfaces to illumination. Next slide. Surfaces should be slip resistant and should not have openings that would allow a 5 8 inch sphere to pass through. This is so cane tips and wheelchair caster wheels won't get stuck in openings. If the surface consists of a perforated material, the openings should be perpendicular to the direction of travel. There's also some exceptions for wheelchair securement components and handles and bridge plates. The surface material itself should not have any abrupt changes that exceed one quarter inch vertical or one half inch with the top quarter inch beveled at a ratio of one to two. Abrupt changes greater than this can be very difficult to push wheelchairs over. These requirements are very similar to those found in the ADA accessibility requirements for buildings. Slide 10. The easiest way to board a vehicle is with level boarding. You just roll or walk right in. If the boarding platforms can be utilized and coordinated with vehicle floor heights, this means of entry is easy to maintain and accessible. Boarding platforms could be constructed to match the height of the vehicle, or vehicles with adjustable ride heights could raise or lower themselves to meet various boarding platforms. The gap between a vehicle and the boarding platform should not be greater than two inches horizontally and five eighths inch vertically. If it is, a ramp would need to span the gap. This could be as simple as deploying the ramp that's already part of the vehicle. The doorway should be 32 inches wide minimum and have a stripe along the bottom marking the edge of the doorway. Also keep in mind, your boarding platform may need detectable warnings. Our presenter in session number two on March 24th will discuss autonomous vehicles that can intelligently align themselves with boarding platforms. Ramps are permitted to fold or telescope and should be designed to support either 300 or 600 pounds, depending on how long the ramp is. When the ramp is in use, it should be firmly attached to the vehicle. When it's not in use, it should be stored in a compartment or securement system. These guidelines require the ramp to be capable of manual operation in case of power failure. Obviously, this is another area that should be further looked into with regards to autonomous vehicles. Ramps should have a clear width of at least 30 inches, edge guards at least two inches high, and visual contrast striping along the perimeter of the ramp. There's also slope requirements for ramps that will be further discussed by other presenters in today's event. Another allowable means of entry and exit to a vehicle is with the use of a lift. Lifts must comply with NHTSA's Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards and permit boarding facing toward or away from the vehicle. A presenter in session two will elaborate on a completely autonomous wheelchair lift. 
Doorways also have a minimum vertical clearance. Larger vehicles are required to provide more vertical clearance, but we should really strive to achieve sufficient vertical clearance even in smaller vehicles so that people do not have to bend or stoop to enter, which can be challenging for many people, especially as they age. Furthermore, as power wheelchairs have increased in size, they now require additional vertical clearance to be able to enter vehicles. We will hear more about this from our presenters today. The final requirement I will briefly cover today is on illumination. Shielded lights should be provided that can illuminate ramps and doorways with a minimum of two foot candles. Illumination is also needed at the boarding area, which should be at least one foot candle. This greatly helps with entering and exiting vehicles at night. I know we went through these requirements pretty quickly today, but we're available to provide technical assistance on these guidelines. Just email us at ta at access-board.gov. Now, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Victor Paquette, who is professor and chair of the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University at Buffalo. He is an affiliate faculty member of the Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access. His research focuses on design practices and accommodations for those with disabilities, including the accessibility and inclusive design of public transportation. He also teaches courses in occupational safety, physical ergonomics, occupational biomechanics, and human factors engineering, and regularly consults with industries on projects related to worker safety, assistive technologies, and human performance. Welcome, Dr. Paquette. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. I am truly honored to have the opportunity to participate in today's public forum. Next slide, please. I, I believe most of us will agree that ramps afford accessibility that stairs do not, but not all ramps are created equal. There are times in which boarding and exiting vehicles via, via ramps can be very challenging for people. I was invited to today's forum to specifically talk about some of the results of research completed at the UB Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access on the use of ramps for boarding and exiting or lighting vehicles. Today, I will summarize the results of two of our studies. These were conducted in the laboratory in what should be considered ideal boarding and exiting environmental conditions. In the first study, we investigated the effects of ramp slope on human performance during ramp ascent and descent. In the second study, we investigated the effects of a different multi-segment ramp configurations on human performance during boarding and exiting a simulated vehicle environment. At the conclusion of this presentation, I will discuss how our, our findings might inform the inclusive or accessible design of public self-driving vehicles and services. Next slide, please. In study one, we addressed the following research questions. First, what is the impact of ramp slope on the ramp ascent and descent performance among mobility aid users? And secondly, does ramp slope have a differential effect on the performance of individuals who use different types of mobility aids? Next slide, please. A total of 80 adult individuals, including manual wheelchair users, power wheelchair users, scooter users, users of white canes or service animals, or users of other walking aids, having a wide variety of age, ages participated in the study. Each research participant ascended and descended ramps of different slopes, including those with a rise to run of one to 12, the shallowest, one to eight, one to six, and one to four. The illustration at the bottom of the slide shows photographs of an individual using a manual wheelchair to ascend a ramp for each of the slope conditions simulated in this lab study. Next slide, please, thank you. Uh, this figure in, in this slide shows a line chart of the mean ramp ascent times for different user groups for each of the ramp conditions. Not surprisingly, Ramp ascent times for manual wheelchair users were lower as slope decreased. Ramp ascent times were consistent for the other user groups, regardless of slope. Virtually no improvement in mean ascent time was observed for slopes of one to six, one to eight, and one to 12 for all user groups. 
except for manual wheelchair users who were able to ascend the ramp most rapidly for the one to 12 slope condition. The figure in this slide shows a line chart of mean perceived exertion for different user groups for each of the ramp, each of the ramp conditions. Perceived exertion tended, uh, trended lower as slopes were reduced, especially for manual wheelchair users. For ramp slopes of one to eight and one to 12, perceived exertion was reported as light or very light for all user groups. The figure in this slide shows a, a line chart of mean perceived difficulty ratings for different user groups for each of the ramp conditions. Ease of ramp use trended higher as slopes were reduced, especially for the manual wheelchair users. Ramp slopes of one to eight and one to 12 had mean ratings that were considered barely moderately or very easy for all user groups during these conditions. Some of the study's other findings were also notable. For example, 33% of our sample could not independently complete the one to four slope condition. And 15% could not independently complete the one to six slope condition. Power wheelchair users, individuals with visual impairments and other ambulation aid users rated descent or going down the ramp more difficult than ascent going up the ramp for the steepest of the ramp slope conditions. Some of our participants also expressed concerns about using ramps in winter. In study two, we address the following research questions. First, does, ramp, does the ramp deployment surface landing height, for example, deployment to street level versus a curb for a multi-segment bus ramp affect the performance of passengers as they enter or exit a bus. Secondly, do the slopes of a multi-segment bus ramp differentially affect users of different types of mobility aids? A total of 66 adult individuals, including manual wheelchair users, power wheelchair users, scooter users, users of white canes or service animals, or users of other walking aids participated in the study. Each research participant was required to board a full-scale mock-up of a low floor bus under laboratory conditions. The photographs on this slide include a frontal view of the segmented ramp, the apparatus used to adjust the height conditions of the ramp, a manual wheelchair user about to ascend the ramp, and an individual using a white cane during ramp ascent into the vehicle. The test conditions simulated a three segment ramp deployment to below street level, street level, a 3.3 inch curb, a 4.5 inch curb, a six inch curb and an eight inch curb. Slopes at the top segment of the ramp were negligible for all conditions. Slopes for the middle segment of the ramp were approximately one to six for street level and below street level conditions and negligible for deployment to curbs. Slopes for the bottom segment of the ramp range from approximately one to five for below street level conditions to one to 15 for the eight inch curb condition. The figure on the left of the slide shows a line chart of the mean ramp ascent times for different user groups for each of the ramp conditions. Ramp ascent times for manual wheelchair and scooter users were lower as slope decreased. Ramp percent times were consistent for all other user groups. Ramp slope conditions that involve deployment to a curb are highlighted because ascent times were lowest and consistent for these conditions. The figure on the right of the slide shows a line chart of the mean descent times for different user groups for each of the ramp conditions. All ramp conditions are highlighted here because ramp descent times were consistently low for all user groups across all ramp conditions. The figure in this slide shows a box plot of the difficulty ratings for different user groups for each of the ramp conditions. Now I know it looks pretty complicated, but a box plot is just a way to illustrate how ratings vary within each of the user groups. 
with the rectangle showing the 50% mid, mid range of the ratings and the upper and lower horizontal lines showing the highest and lowest ratings for a user group. Each of the ramp use, uh, ease of ramp use trended higher for ramp conditions involving curves for each of the user groups. With ramp deployment conditions of a six inch and eight inch curb rated as at least moderately easy by all user groups. These conditions are highlighted in the red boxes of the figure with ratings above the green line being moderately or very easy. Okay, this study also had some very notable findings. 20% of manual wheelchair users required assistance even for the 4.5 inch curb condition. We found that the three segment ramp alleviated many of the grade break problems and slope problems of early two segment or solid ramp designs. Lastly, we found that ramps that created uneven floor surfaces, previous studies within the vehicle during deployment uh, could create trip and fall hazards and reduce clear spaces for turning and maneuvering inside the vehicle. So in summary, our work supports a maximum slope for transit ramps of one to six with, severe, with less severe slopes preferred to support independent ascent of manual wheelchair users. With a, maximum, with a one to six maximum slope at street level, any environmental improvement such as the use of curbs will support easier entry and exit. The figure on the right of the slide shows a shuttle sized self-driving vehicle with side door open and ramp of moderate slope deployed to a curb. There are some other important issues that need to be addressed related to the use of ramps for boarding and exiting self-driving vehicles. Choices will have to be made about how to address boarding and exiting needs and preferences of all passengers and how to communicate the deployment status of a ramp during boarding and exiting to ensure passenger safety when no driver is available. Ramp storage areas in the floor sometimes compete with other vehicle components such as the vehicle's batteries. While this is challenging, it appears that OEMs are finding ways to incorporate automated ramps into the vehicle designs. Finally, the pickup and drop off location ideally will involve a curb or an elevated platform to reduce ramp slopes to the extent possible and should provide adequate space to allow those using wheel mobility devices enough clearance to maneuver onto and off of the ramp easily within the pedestrian right of way. The figure on the right side of the slide shows a taxi sized self-driving vehicle with side door open and a ramp having shallow, a shallow slope deployed to the curb. This presentation was funded in part by grants from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, otherwise known as NIDLR. NIDLR is a center within the Administration of Community Living, ACL, the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. The contents of this presentation do not necessarily reflect the policy of NIDLR, ACL, HHS, and you should not assume endorsement by, federal, by the federal government. While I look forward to remaining on today's panel for the question and answer period, if you have any additional questions or comments about this presentation that you'd like to share with me personally, please, please feel free to contact me via the information provided on this slide. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much for your presentation, Victor. We did have a couple questions come in. Uh, the first one, what types of materials are being used to roughen the surface of the ramp? It's a great question. I don't necessarily have the answer to, to that. Maybe our next speaker might, but uh, certainly different kinds of surfaces are being tested. Um, the more friction we can, um, we, we can design into the ramp, I think most would say better. I don't uh, think we're gonna get to a point where people are sticking to the ramps. Um, we in our laboratory studies, as I mentioned, ran them in uh, ideal environments. So we didn't necessarily have lots of problems associated with friction because we were specifically studying the impacts of slope and other design elements on the boarding and alighting or exiting experience. 
And one other question, Victor. Um, in your study, was it an option for participants in manual wheelchairs to try to go up the ramp backwards? Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about that. It was performed a few years ago. I, I believe that the individuals in the study were, were not um, going up the ramp backwards in those studies for um, a, a number of reasons, one including the safety of the individuals in the lab experience. As, as you might expect, we had um, researchers there to ensure the safety of individuals when they were using the ramps. And um, <clears throat> in the first study, um, the ramp was quite wide, potentially safer for those kinds of maneuvering activities. In the second study, there was um, the individuals were expected to board a simulated low floor bus and uh, that the, the, there were obstacles at the top of the ramp that might've created problems for them in terms of their ability to maneuver without seeing those obstacles. So mm -hmm. um, my recollection is that we did not allow for that. Okay, thank you very much, Victor. So now moving on with our presentation, I'd like to welcome Amy Shopman from the, the Director of Government Relations for the National Mobility Equipment Dealers Association. Amy has represented the automotive mobility industry before the federal government and various state governments since 2010, and has contributed to legislative, regulatory, and other policy-related initiatives addressing driver rehabilitation, automobile adaptive equipment, quality assurance, vehicle modification, inclusive design, and autonomous vehicles. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Randall, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am with the National Mobility Equipment Dealers Association, also known as NAMIDA, which is the National Trade Association for the Automotive Mobility Industry. NAMIDA's membership includes companies that design and manufacture automotive mobility solutions, such as converted or accessible vehicles, mobility device securement systems, customized seating, steering and braking solutions and more. And you'll be hearing from one of those members, Braun Ability, very shortly. But first I'd like to thank the Access Board for initiating this important public dialogue. Autonomous vehicles have become a major topic of discussion these past few years. And as we inch closer to the widespread deployment of technologies that were once relegated to the realm of science fiction, there are many complex issues to contemplate and challenges to be solved before the transportation revolution becomes reality, including ensuring safety, updating the nation's infrastructure, developing a regulatory framework, and more. But the vital importance of ensuring that autonomous vehicles are accessible to passengers with disabilities cannot be overstated. The potential of autonomous vehicles to increase safe and accessible transportation solutions for people with disabilities is incredible. But if that outcome is to be achieved, we must work collectively to ensure that the associated complexities and challenges of designing accessible vehicle systems are considered upfront as opposed to being considered an afterthought. And to paraphrase Secretary Buttigieg, we certainly don't want to miss an opportunity here for equity and accessibility. So NAMIDA will continue working to achieve that goal. And thank you again to the board for organizing this meeting series and amplifying the accessibility aspect of this larger autonomous vehicle discourse. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, joining us from the great state of Indiana, very Hoosier heavy today, um, Kevin Frayne, following a 30 year product development, marketing and consumer research career at General Motors, Kevin joined Ronability in 2018. As the Director of Advanced Mobility Solutions, Kevin is focused on bringing the latest technologies into accessible transportation products for wheelchair users. Kevin, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Amy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanna thank the US Access Board for having us all here. Uh, as Amy mentioned, I have a very diverse background, engineer, marketer, strategist, researcher, uh, the nice thing of coming from a, a big corporation into a much more smaller and nimble company like Broad Ability is I'm able to do all of them at once on, on admittedly some, some very uh, interesting and important products. 
Uh, I'm kind of the futurist for wheelchair accessible transportation within the company. So as modes of transportation morph and change and evolve or, or, or the eventual revolution, we're working hard and me specifically on how can we ensure that we take advantage of that technology at the leading edge to help wheelchair users continue to, uh, to have transportation solutions. A big focus of my job obviously is electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, connectivity. And so that's why I'm here talking to you today. I'm gonna to bring a little bit of what we've learned over the past few years working in this field. Next slide, please. Okay, there are various milestones in accessibility. I just pulled up a few here. Um, the first picture there, which uh, 1966, I know exactly how many years ago that was, unfortunately. Uh, there's Ralph Braun on his tri-wheel scooter on the ramp on the back of his mail truck that he built for himself. And that led to the birth of the company I work for today as others wanted also to benefit from his invention and be accessible uh, if they had a, a, a you know, disability and were in a wheelchair. We're devoted to making life a moving experience and are continuing doing that into the future. The ADA came along in 1990. It helped solidify the rules and the regulations, set the standards and ensure that everyone who was working to, to make accessible transportation solutions was all kind of marching and doing um, the, the minimum required. As we talk about the future, and I, I kept it in this decade here still, you know, we've all said that autonomous vehicles have the chance to really change transportation uh, for the disabled. It has the potential to make everyday transportation a given and not a challenge. Um, and that's why we're excited to be part of this discussion and talk about some of the things we learned. What am I going to talk about? Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, accessible AVs, evolution or revolution. So I'll hit on that quickly. I'm going to give you a jump geometry refresher. No test will be coming. And then let's talk about, we've already alluded to, autonomous electric batteries. What does it mean and how does it impact uh, getting uh, wheelchair users and those with uh, accessible or disabilities in and out of the vehicle? Next slide, please. AVs, evolution or revolution. Autonomous vehicles are A, like today's vehicles, B, reimagined transportation solutions, C, they're electric, D, privately owned, E, are they shared? F, are they multi-passenger public transportation or G, are they all of the above? And you probably know what my answer is gonna be. Next slide, please. They're all of the above. So I, I think what's important as we even talk about how this has the chance to really change transportation options and solutions for the disabled, that it's not something that we need to wait for the ideal and the ultimate 10 years from now, eight years from now, 20 years from now, whatever it is, because they're here now today. Um, many of these vehicles, matter of fact, I think almost all the ones you see here on my slide are available for most people in certain cities to go and get in and call up on their rideshare app and go into riding them today. So it's not just trying to figure out how we define the future. We're evolving into the future right now. We have to be ready for that short-term, mid-term, and that, that ultimate long-term. Um, I want to thank Dr. Paquette. He showed it earlier, but that vehicle at the bottom is a Navia autonomous vehicle uh, that has an ADA ramp solution that we spent a few years developing with them. And it's currently running in pilot in a Detroit neighborhood and medical center. So, uh, so again, it's, it's here now. We, we, we can't start talking about it. We should have already been talking about it. Next, please. Uh, entry exit, it's all about the geometry. You just heard Dr. Paquette talk about the influence of ramps and, and how one to four really is kind of like the bare minimum and there are much uh, lesser uh, ramp angles that make it much, much easier for manual wheelchair users. I had the chance to participate in some consumer research a few years ago uh, for our Traverse vehicle. And with a 10 and a half uh, ramp angle, I was watching a manual wheelchair user. He was probably 30 years old, very uh, fit. And I watched him inch by inch push up that ramp. And it was, as someone new to the uh, industry, I was kind of taken aback a little bit. And he got to the top and I asked him, okay, how would you rate that? One being worse, five being excellent. And he said, five. And I about fell over. I'm like, how could you rate that excellent? He's like, well, they're all like that and I'm used to it. So I think it just goes to show from what Dr. Paquette said that, you know, you can do better than the bare minimum and you start looking at the different users, they kind of have different needs. 
And that's why from a geometry perspective, step in really defines what a vehicle is set up for. So as we look at these new autonomous vehicles, um, you know, they require some new and different uh, solutions in order to get wheelchair users into them. Um, you know, a 10 inch step in is great and eight inches even better. Um, and it's all about that triangle and making it as easy for the wheelchair user. Next, please. Um, step in kind of drives the solution. So here's a couple examples right here. We have a pair of transit bus on the left uh, with a traditional lift. And on the right, we have a wave with a ramp. Um, very rarely is someone looking at a vehicle or, or and trying to figure out which one should I do. The geometry is kind of defining what you're going to do or what you can do. Um, lifts don't necessarily tend lend themselves easily to full autonomous operation. Uh, it's something we are looking at and working on for the future. But ultimately, we know that normalcy of ramps is something that uh, wheelchair users and the advocate community is really pushing for. Um, and so that really is the ideal solution um, to, to get a step in design on an AV that can support a ramp angle that is going to work for a wheelchair user. Uh, next, please. Randall talked about this briefly, but he asked me to hit on interior height additionally. So when you look at the requirements uh, in the regulations as you're looking at a new vehicle, um, it'll have a 56 inch uh, interior height minimum also, same as the door opening. Uh, but as you can see here on, on the vehicles we create today, we're anywhere from 59 to 61 inches. Um, so going higher is not only desired, it really is much more practical on a daily basis to go above what's called out there in the regulation. Uh, next, please. Batteries. So Dr. Paquette mentioned this one too. Um, EVs uh, tend to be AVs and we've got uh, underfloor batteries that are like something we've never seen before in automotive architecture. It really constrains what you can do to get somebody in and out of the vehicle. Uh, they're sometimes structural, um, almost never movable. Uh, some of the skateboard chassis uh, have them built in. Uh, some of the unibody constructions still have body uh, batteries in the floor. It's a great place to put them in the floor. It keeps a low center of gravity. You can spread them out um, for able-bodied people. But as soon as we're trying to figure out how to get a ramp solution, we come back to that geometry and uh, getting a good step in is really important. Um, they, they tend to preclude easily attaching lifts or even ramps or even wheelchair securement inside the vehicle because now you have something uh, uh, very critical under floor that you need to stay away from. So what do we do with that? Let's go to the next slide, please. We have solutions that uh, kind of run the gamut from what I've been talking about, evolutionary to revolutionary. So certainly on an AV, you can look at uh, one of the um, uh, a folding ramp um, that can attach on the floor, folds out for entry and exit. Um, the nice thing about it too, as we uh, heard mentioned earlier from Randall on uh, no power failure operation, uh, a segment of wheelchair users still like these a lot in their personal ways because uh, it's, it's easy to deploy when you're inside the vehicle if the power goes out. As we move on, um, there's things such as uh, flooring solutions. So we've got some 20 millimeter flooring solutions uh, that is bondable to an interior vehicle floor. So it stays above the batteries, it stays out of the batteries. And what this can do is give you a new surface to attach things like lifts, like ramps, um, and even allows for wheelchair, wheelchair securement solutions to go inside the vehicle. It also allows flexibility too. So you can have a, a track mounts in there where you need them. And it allows you to kind of uh, adapt your AV to potentially where it's working and, and what your uh, duty cycle looks like for a disabled. And lastly, going below the floor. So I'm going to say if you give me a 50 millimeter slot above the batteries below the floor, uh, we've got some ultra thin solutions that are being finalized right now on an ADA solution that will, uh, will satisfy what EVs and AVs are looking for. Okay, next slide, please. So in summary, Innovate for the now and the later. It's, it's not going to happen overnight, and we don't need to be planning for 10 years from now. We need to be looking at yesterday, quite truthfully, and today, and how we evolve into the different phases of AV to get to that, that ideal endpoint. Step in is critical. Geometry is critical. 
Um, and as we have new vehicle architectures that are severely limiting how we make them accessible, it's something that if thought about up front can make um, accessibility that much easier. Um, and then batteries, of course, AVs really are EVs. They don't have to be, but it looks like they're, they're pretty much all going to be. And they have some unique challenges and solutions. Thank you. Oh, one more slide, sorry. Um, this is our new Brown Ability Global Innovation Lab in Carmel, Indiana. Um, you can see we actually had some snow down here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that will actually open in just a few weeks on April 1st. Uh, this is an engineering lab that will help accelerate uh, market shaping innovation. And we're focusing on EVs, AVs, uh, sensing, IoT, uh, those kind of things here. Um, this is where we're going to house a, a team we're working on with Purdue on an autonomous vehicle accessibility project. So that will be worked on there for the next 18 months. Now that's my last slide, I think. Thank you very much for that presentation, Kevin. We had a couple questions come in for you. Yep. Uh, first, do you have any lifts that can be deployed out the driver's side of the vehicle or either side of the vehicle, depending on the location of the sidewalk or curb? Uh, when you say lifts, I'm assuming it probably means just uh, entry. A lift or a ramp that can go out both sides of the vehicle. Yeah. Um, uh, that has been a question that we've been in discussions with various folks over the last year. Um, dual sided is something that hasn't really been asked for in the past because you typically have a driver who can navigate and figure out where to put a vehicle. Um, you know, autonomous vehicles, we know that the last 10 to 15% of figuring out that AI stack to drive these things is hard. And I like to say, if you think that's hard, put a vehicle in a city street with traffic, with pedestrians, with a wheelchair, someone on a corner with, with, with curb cuts and try to figure that one out, that's gonna be, I think, even more challenging. Um, so do we have solutions that can go out either door? I mean, a lot of our solutions can be mounted in either place. Uh, we, we obviously have space constraints on how you execute them. We do not have a dual-sided ramp in our uh, arsenal today, but it's, it's something we've uh, been talking about. Has Braun worked on mechanical kneeling solutions for electric vehicles? Um, we, we work on kneeling solutions, yes, for, for any vehicle with a suspension. Uh, kneeling is a critical part to help get to a desired step in. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do kneeling and we work on it for electric vehicles and, and different types of vehicles, so yeah. And given that there's some oversized wheelchairs that can be up to 36 inches wide, is there any discussion about a wider door width? What door widths are you currently working with? I would, well, I mean, from our perspective, uh, we haven't had any, uh, you know, I'd say consumer demand or, or even commercial demand wider than the uh, current prescribed. I guess I'd throw that back to you, uh, Randall, on whether that has come up from a regulatory standpoint at all. Um, I know bariatric has, has come up in some of our discussions um, and how to accommodate such a, you know, a different size of occupants and wheelchairs in a vehicle with tight spaces. Well, if anyone has a particular concern about uh, wider wheelchairs, please feel free to let us know at the, the website, transportationinnovation.idscale.com. So given this time now, it's three o'clock, we're gonna wrap up the questions and we're going to move on now to our open discussion. The open discussion portion of our event. As I mentioned previously, please submit your request to speak using Zoom's Q&A feature and briefly state who you are in any organization you may represent, as well as what you'd like to speak about. If you called in or having difficulty using the Q&A feature, you can email your request, your request to speak to our email address at events at access-board.gov. We'll do our very best to give everyone a chance to speak but we do have a very high number of participants on today's event. So we request that you limit your comments to two minutes or less. So our first comment is going to come from Nico Larco, uh, the Director of Urbanism next at the University of Oregon. Nico, you should be able to unmute yourself. And after Nico, we will have Peter James. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Access Board for convening this conversation. Really great to have it and great to see the support from Secretary Buttigieg uh, for this work. I'm um, very much looking forward to the, up, uh, the upcoming sessions, but one thing that I really want to emphasize is 
that we look at this as the whole ecosystem approach and not only the vehicle or vehicle related issues of travel. Um, that this is really what needs to be addressed if we're thinking about um, making sure that there's accessibility for all. Uh, we recently did at Urbanism Next here at the University of Oregon, a project with AARP and RAND to try to understand the impacts of AVs and new mobility on older adults, it included lit literature review, interviews with a bunch of different stakeholders and a round table of approximately 30 leaders uh, from around the country. The three main takeaways are one, that we really do need to address the entire ecosystem. And that means you know everything from, yes, how do we get in and outside of the vehicle? Do you feel safe during that trip? What happens if something goes wrong? Can you take goods and aids with you? Does it go where you want to go? Is it available in your area? Will it stay available in your area? But also things outside of travel itself. Can you call it? Do you have access to smartphones? Can you use it? Can you find the vehicle? When it drops you off, can you orient yourself? Um, do you know where the front door is? And can you afford it, afford it? And how might these types of services affect things like transit? Will it be limiting uh, access for all? Um, the other two main takeaways were one, that the harder to serve are really nobody's problem right now. And uh, this is not a, a slight on the, on the private sector in the least. It is very difficult uh, business model as we know. And so they're focusing on the, their target audience, which is typically young, able-bodied and wealthy enough and, and tech enabled. Uh, but the harder to serve is really nobody's problem right now. And then the last one is really that there's no consensus. So in this round table, we asked you know, people, there was general agreement that the framework that we developed in this research was, was uh, uh, fairly accurate and, and correct, uh, but there was no cons consensus on who should lead each part of this, who has the know-how, experience, jurisdiction, funding to do this. And it wasn't so much a finger pointing, which you uh, might see between different uh, uh, stakeholders. It was more just really a, more of a head scratching of like, well, we're not really sure who would be best to lead in each one of these topics that I mentioned before. Um, it's, this is a great, uh, I love that the access board is, is, uh, taking the role right now. And it really shows the need for more forums and broader conversation, the stuff discussion. And the last point I'd just like to emphasize is really focusing not only on the vehicle, not only on finding the vehicle, but the entire ecosystem to make sure that, uh, travel is accessible to all. Thank you so much for the time. Yep. Thank you very much for your comment. Our next commenter is Peter James. And after Peter James will be Sarah Malayer. I apologize if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly. Peter James, you should be able to unmute. And one last chance for Peter James, otherwise we'll try to come back to you. All right, let's move on to Sarah Malayer, M-A-L-A-I-E-R. Sarah, are you able to unmute? Hi, yes, uh, this is Sarah Malaire, and you did get my name correct. I'm with the American Foundation for the Blind, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to at, um, pose a question. Um, I, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm thinking about from the perspective of people who are blind or have low vision um, is, is ways that we can um, address multiple potential challenges with autonomous vehicles at the same time. So, uh, um, it seems to me when we're designing a, a ramp system, we're not just designing, uh, you know, the, the ramp, but we're also designing where the vehicle decides to pick people up or drop them off. Um, and so to what, um, to what extent have we begun to think about um, how the, the vehicle will identify safe places to deploy the ramp and how maybe those opportunities for safely deploying a ramp could also be combined with opportunities to in, um, increase the, the findability of the vehicle um, so that, that users um, who may not be located directly at the curb that they need to be at can, can navigate to the vehicle and safely board, um, board it. Thank you very you. much for your comment and please be sure to come back to our second session where we should have a speaker that will address some of those issues. Our next commenter will be Christine Fitzgerald and followed by Christine will be Michael Bray. Christine, you should be able to unmute yourself. Christine Fitzgerald. There we go. Okay. Hello. How okay. are you? Hello. Great. So really quick question, and I know that some of it may be addressed in the next um, group, um, but I would really love to hear um, what will be done or what is being done to address the issue of safety as far as 
uh, trying to get back out if there's a power failure or other incident, not only from the standpoint of being able to reach um, over or around the ramp to uh, open up the door, but certainly being able to unlock the chair. And that is going to be a super critical thing. Same thing for anybody else. Um, when we're looking at visual impairments or hearing impairments, hearing impairments, you're not going to hear any noise, obviously. But visual cues will let you know, hey, I need to get out. But for those that uh, have either vision loss or, um, or who are blind or who have mobility issues, um, having a safe path of travel and having the ability to get out for themselves is going to be super critical. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. And again, please make sure you come back to our second session where we'll talk about wheelchair securement. Our next comment will be from Jonathan Katz and followed by Jonathan Katz is uh, Rick Hodgkins. Jonathan, you should be able to unmute yourself. Jonathan Katz. All right, not hearing a Jonathan Katz. Let's see if uh, Rick Hodgkins is available. I got it, I got it. Uh, okay, Jonathan. Yes, we can, Jonathan, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I'm also on the phone, but the phone is not working for me. Um, something I've been concerned about is accessibility for people with dementia who often have mobility disabilities as well and not necessarily having a clear indication that they can enter now, they can exit now, or how to operate a ramp or if, say, if it's a push button. And so thinking about that in the context of when we're designing ramps and when we're designing other accessible entries and exits, I think it's very important, especially given as Nico said, that there are many people, um, older people who aren't really being catered for right now by discussions around autonomous vehicles. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, next is Rick's, uh, Rick Hodgkins, followed by Nina Beatty. Rick, are you able to unmute? Trying to let them know. I'm with an AR. Mute. Currently unmuted. I'll plus I want them to know I'm. Yes, you are unmuted, Rick Hodgkins. Okay. Receive the text answer colon Bill and Brad answered at 1209. All right. Um, I know my question about, uh, I have um, a, one way to help the uh, blind, um, the, uh, help the people like myself that are blind to know when their vehicle is here is the question, Colin, to make up. sure that uh, there's an audio, something that's audible to let them know that their vehicle has arrived. Not every blind person is going to require a ramp, mm -hmm. first off, and second, I heard a lot of talk about people in manual wheelchairs, but what about those people? But the, what about those people in electric wheelchairs, scooters, utility carts? Um, I plan to attend the sessions on blind and low vision to address my question about how blind Receive people. The question. I know that the. Um, I know that all this will be on an iPhone, Android or iPhone app. By the way, the iPhone is the best phone app for the best phone for the blind. But um, anyway, that's my take. We need to make sure that blind people will know when their vehicle has arrived. What if they're inside? Um, and of course, what if they, even if they're outside, if they're totally blind, they may not be able to see where their vehicle is. Receive the question. What if they have to, something has to give. There has to, it's a give and take world. They have to know when they're, where their vehicle is, even if they can't see it. So there must be something done. This can be addressed during the sessions that deal, that which deal with the blind and low vision. And again, while I don't require to be in a wheelchair, I have not heard electric wheelchair users be mentioned, only manual wheelchair users. 
So, and that's a question Receive out to Dr. Paquette or Piquet, whatever his name is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very to okay. yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I would just simply respond to that. I'm sorry, I didn't get the gentleman's um, name at the beginning of this. And um, if I maybe talked a little too fast, um, you may have you may have missed it. We certainly included uh, power wheelchair users and scooter users in our studies, and I'd be happy to speak with you offline about the details of those studies. Thank you. Thanks very much for that clarification, Dr. Paquette. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll add too, Randall, that I mean, any of the solutions we're working with, they apply across the board to manual chairs, power chairs, scooters, whatever. A uh, thousand pound weight capacity is typically what's designed to, so there's no uh, constraint on whatever device they're on. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to, it looks like our next commenter is Jenny Sykes, and Jenny will be followed by Heather Sturgill. Jenny Sykes, are you able to unmute? Jenny yes, Sykes. Hi. Okay, this hello. Jenny Sykes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I believe I inadvertently signed up to be in the queue when I did not intend to, but while I'm on the queue, let me just say this has been a really great program and I really appreciate everyone's efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, Heather Sturgill and after Heather Sturgill will be Timothy Woods. Heather, are you able to unmute? Heather Sturgill. If not, we'll move on to Timothy Woods and after Timothy Woods would be Nina. Timothy Woods, are you able to unmute? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Um, first of all, I absolutely love the presentations from Kevin and Victor. Um, we, uh, so I represent the Autonomous Vehicle Alliance and last year, the entire year of 2020, we did a piece of research um, regarding uh, very much focused on accessible and barrier-free vehicles and infrastructure and how the two could um, maximize the efficiency of each other. Um, there's a lot that we have, could share. We shared some initial stuff with the US Access Board and with ITSA, but um, I believe that one of the biggest uh, duh opportunities that we came across, quite frankly, was looking at the opportunity between vehicle design moving forward, particularly for AVs and infrastructure design, what infrastructure that those vehicles will be interoperating with. And we would love to see an effort, a, a, a kind of a cross ecosystem effort between the people who procure the services of architectural and engineering firms, the mobility market, OEMs in particular, to actually start looking at design languages that can be common between the vehicle and infrastructure. So wayfinding and, and coming to that nirvana of what the complete trip is could be enabled for various uh, forms of disability and ability. Um, something that quite frankly moves more towards universal design um, than away from it, if that makes any sense. Um, so anyway, that is just wanted to throw that out there from an infrastructure and vehicle design perspective, many other things in our study, but that was kind of the uh, duh that we kind of ran across as we were talking with municipal and state transportation authorities and those individuals who interoperate with those vehicles. Thank you very much, Mr. Woods. Um, now it looks like we're going to try to go back to Nina Beattie. Nina, are you able to unmute? And after Nina Beattie would be Lisa Ratner. But one more chance for Nina Beattie. All right, not hearing Nina Beattie. Uh, Lisa Ratner, are you able to speak? Hi, um, I was curious about um, foldable wheelchairs, if that is something that uh, you guys have looked at as well. I'm just trying to understand also the percentage breakdown of how many users use foldable versus non-foldable, um, just because I imagine some people want to fold the wheelchair and then ingress, egress um, themselves if they have the ability to, maybe a caretaker folds it and secures it. Just like to hear more about that. Great. I think I'd like to pose this one to some of our presenters today. Would any of you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on it. Um, 
Well, between rigid, we're talking manual wheelchairs, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Sounds like, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, rigid chairs tend to be used more by users who are, who are in the chair uh, because they need to be. Uh, there's definitely a wide range of folks who are in folding chairs. Um, but yeah, I guess if you're talking transfer, I mean, that's something that we're working on too. So coming up with solutions to secure chairs inside a, a vehicle, whatever type it might be, and to allow that person to then transfer into a seat. So that is being worked on uh, and is out there in the uh, realm of things that are, that are coming. And Victor, anything to weigh in on this, uh, particularly regarding your study and some of the people that may be using rigid wheelchairs versus foldable ones? Yeah, uh, I'll keep it pretty, sh pretty short. I, I, I think that th this was gonna be in some ways more of an issue for maneuvering inside the, the vehicle and figuring out how best to store the wheelchair when someone transfers in terms of um, using the ramps, which is what we were in a sense charged with today, at least boarding and exiting issues. Um, you know, I, I'd suggest if people are in that situation, they're probably going to be more uh, likely to fold the chair and, and use the ramp um, because they, they'll, they'll be able to do so um, more successfully with less energy and less biomechanical stress. But we did not study that in our research uh, that I described for you today. Thank you. So our next comment will come from Linda Oseki, O-S-I-E-C-K-I, -E followed by Ron Brooks. Linda, are you able to unmute? Linda Oseki, O-S-I-E-C-K-I. -E uh, yeah, sorry. I, I was the person who had asked about the widths. Um, you know, in the 2002, 2010 anthropometry report, uh, that's where vehicle um, a device um, widths were over 38 inches. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just want to make sure that any of this is accessible for people of who are using all kinds of devices and people aren't uh, restricted because they have something that's a little wider. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I, I know in our second session, we'll have somebody speak uh, a little bit more about wheelchair anthropometrics, um, but Victor, did you want to weigh in quickly today? Sure, I can weigh in quickly. I think it's both um, an issue of width and length, frankly. Um, we often don't allow for enough clearances in terms of the length of the wheelchair too. And um, I think those will be handled probably or addressed. Some of those issues will be addressed by someone from the um, UB Idea Center in the next round of presentations. Her name's Jordana Maisel, she's great. Mm -hmm. Our next comment core question comes from Ron Brooks and after Ron Brooks would be Eric Dibner. Ron Brooks, are you able to unmute? Ron there I am. Can you Hello. hear me now? Yes. Can you we hear can. me? Okay. Yes. Um, so just a couple of questions around Pat, uh, around um, the lift uh, design and, and also uh, the app. Um, so just in thinking about the ramp, one of the questions I had is, is has work been done? Um, you, you talked a lot about um, the, the slope of the ramp. Uh, but the distance of the ramp could have impacts for people who have challenges walking longer distances, either because of fatigue um, um, or because of the ability to stay to walk straight within a narrow ramp, such as folks with visual impairments or uh, people who are frail and who may have balance issues. Um, was any research done to address the, uh, the distance of the ramp in terms of those types of issues? Uh, the other comment is more of a comment um, is, is there a way, assuming that, that AVs have um, de you know, deployable uh, ramps um, on, you know, on all vehicles within, say, a service, is it possible to link um, the settings for deploying a ramp to a user's profile? So for example, um, if I'm using a service that uses AVs I can set a preference in the app to automatically deploy the lift so that I don't have to uh, try to do that when the vehicle arrives. Are those the kinds of things that are being looked at? So that's definitely something that uh, we've heard a lot about and I believe you'll hear more about that in session two. Uh, but I also wanted to give um, Victor a chance to respond to the initial part of your inquiry regarding ramp lengths. 
So regarding ramp lengths, ours were in both cases fixed length. So we, we didn't study um, the ramp uh, length as part of our protocol. Um, but I think what you've suggested are things that are being looked into um, very carefully by a number of agencies, including us at the UB Idea Center in terms of the technologies that you can introduce so that you can ad adapt ramps to an individual's preferences. Thank you. Hey, Randall, I'll just add for the second part. Um, sure. Absolutely. I mean, trying to figure out in the, the world of connections, I mean, we've got so many connections for so many other devices. It just makes sense that there's a future in the not too distant future where we're leveraging uh, personalized information to make things easier for, for the disabled and for wheelchair users so that the vehicle knows who you are and knows where that ramp needs to be or you know, the securement device knows what kind of chair you have and can, can adjust to it accordingly and secure it properly. So that stuff's being worked on and it, it's the future someday, and hopefully sooner rather than later. All right, it looks like our next commenter is Eric Dibner, followed by Elsa Caballero. Eric Dibner, are you able to unmute? I think I did, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm in the state of Maine where I'm an accessibility specialist working with the Bureau of Rehab Services and on the Moving Maine network uh, team. We are uh, a very rural state. I know a lot of vehicles are uh, being tested in urban settings. Are there uh, I indications of what uh, technologies will be important for boarding and alighting in a rural area where, the where there is no pavement, for example, in someone's yard? Thank you very much for your comment. And um, I'll just quickly mention that in the updated guidelines for buses and vans, one of the slope requirements considers um, deploying the ramp to the to the ground, to the vehicle, um, the, the drive surface. Uh, did anyone of our presenters also want to weigh in on this? Well, I, I guess it just goes back to my comments earlier on you know having a driverless vehicle figure out how best to handle the situation. I mean, whether it's a city example I gave here or, or rural and the other challenges it may be. So, I mean, sensing is, is everywhere today. So it's just a matter of these AV developers uh, and, and folks who are working with them like us. You know, those are challenges we're working on, on trying to make sure that the environmental surroundings and everything mm -hmm. uh, will integrate well with whatever solution is there. Yep. And again, I'd encourage you to come back to our second session where this will be discussed in further detail. Our next comment comes from Elsa. Elsa Caballero, are you able to unmute? And after Elsa would be Lisa Hayes. Yes, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I work for San Diego Center for the Blind in California, and um, I want to echo everything that people have been talking about with difficulties, people with vision loss, um, they struggle with, with autonomous vehicles and you know, uh, mobility in general when it comes to vehicles. Um, and I want to specifically, I guess, uh, comment or question about the sound or the audible feedback we're going to get back from the auto autonomous vehicle, um, specifically knowing that your vehicle has arrived. Um, people with vision loss may see a car who's parked in front of them, but they might, may not necessarily know that that is their ride. Um, in addition to that, um, whether they need the ramp deployed or not need the ramp deployed, how can they um, be able to do that um, at a distance um, without needing to maybe touch the car to push a button or um, how will that need be addressed and recognizing where the door is so they can um, uh, enter and exit the vehicle safely with the vision loss. Thank you for your comment and be sure to come back to our second as well as the third and fourth sessions that'll focus on communication. It looks like our last commenter of today will be Lisa Hayes. Lisa, are you able to unmute? Hi, I also did not realize I put my hand raised, but I, I will just really quickly comment that I thank you so much for this presentation, for this conversation. Um, it's gonna be a game changer for people with disabilities. We appreciate your um, efforts sincerely, um, but, and that's it, thank you. Thank you. We might have time for one more. Donna DeSanto Ott, OTT. Donna DeSanto. Donna DeSanto. 
Otherwise, we'll move on to Ray Smith. Ray Smith, are you available? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ray. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for making me famous there. That's me in the Navia picture there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, what were some of the challenges um, with the Navia, uh, the ramp? Because we know that uh, with the deployment, as I was part of the operating team there, um, the shuttle actually with the air, air shocks wouldn't go down far enough to have the ramp more operable for a manual chair. But I noticed that once we uh, deployed the ramp on a curve, it was very smooth. So what were the challenges in terms of the aftermarket ramp for that particular vehicle? Uh, well, uh, as you know, but probably others don't, uh, the Navia's batteries are in the ends, right? <laughs> so that greatly uh, enhanced the ability to uh, take an existing ramp design and do some modifications to it to uh, specialize it for that application. Um, but it is an underfloor ramp, uh, under vehicle ramp, essentially. Um, so that just is a much cleaner, smoother uh, application. Um, you know, deploying to ground, deploying to, uh, to, to curb, I mean, those are operational parameters that, you know, I'm assuming uh, if you're affiliated with Navi as an operator, I mean, that's just something to take into consideration of where you are. Um, I believe that is a one to six slope ramp, um, but it probably just does, just does show that, uh, you know, one to six still isn't um, the easiest thing if you're in a manual chair, potentially. All right. Uh, now, if we could go to slide 52, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's event. We've had such a lively discussion, and although today's open discussion has come to an end, the conversation continues online at transportationinnovation.ideascale.com, where you can contribute ideas, comment on other people's ideas, and vote on ideas you like. If we weren't able to get to your comment or question today, please enter it in the online dialog so it can be part of the conversation. If you need any assistance using the Ideascale platform, please contact epolicyworks at dol.gov. I'd also like to thank our presenters, Victor, Amy, and Kevin, as well as everyone who helped make today's event possible, including the Director of the Office of Technical and Information System Services, Davey Anchulis, our friends at ODEP, including Lindsay Teal, and their support team, including Hope Adler, Danielle Germain, as well as Brian Bard at ACL, and the many people here at the Access Board helping behind the scenes, including Francis Spiegel and Phil Brada. Thank you all for helping launch this four-part series on autonomous vehicles. Our next session will be held on March 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. It will continue the conversation of entering and exiting autonomous vehicles with a focus on level boarding and automated lifts, as well as maneuvering within vehicles and automated wheelchair securement. We will have opening remarks from Jennifer Sheehy, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Disability Employment Policy at the Department of Labor, and presenters will include the U.S. Access Board, Robotics Research, the University of Michigan, and University at Buffalo. If you have not already done so, please register for this event on our website. Each Zoom session is a separate link, so be sure to register for all the ones you'd like to attend. We're looking forward to hearing from you again in two weeks. Now, I'd like to turn it back to the Chair of the Access Board, Greg Fairbach, to close out our event. Well, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, especially uh, thanks to you, Randall. Well done in uh, coordinating this uh, uh, exciting and uh, very informative question and answer, as well as just managing the uh, uh, speakers. Uh, we, we're greatly appreciative of your efforts. Uh, on behalf of the board also, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us today. Uh, from the public and, and uh, especially those who were able to make comment or, or give questions. Uh, it's always important and uh, uh, for us to understand what our fellow neighbors are uh, thinking about. And I know this topic uh, of autonomous vehicles is gonna really spur conversation. And we've already seen that happen today and look forward to that happening uh, over the next three meetings. So uh, thanks to everyone through their, uh, for their comments. Don't forget to, you also have the ability to do online discussion uh, and uh, for the platforms. And, and uh, if you have any questions, you can do that and uh, we'll get back to you uh, with those questions or have them prepared for the uh, next.
next meetings that uh, will be conducted. Um, special thanks to each and every one of the speakers. Uh, we appreciate your expertise uh, and uh, your thoughts on the process. Without you, uh, as subject matter experts, uh, we would be, uh, uh, it wouldn't be a ro as robust a meeting as it was. So thanks to you all for uh, uh, helping us advance in inclusivity uh, in the concept of transportation. Uh, grateful for your, for your efforts. At this time, we're gonna take a break uh, and we're going to uh, go off from about uh, 3.30 to four. At four o'clock Eastern time, uh, the board will reconvene to conduct the regular business uh, of the board uh, for this, the March meeting. Uh, please be advised, you're welcome to join us to hear what uh, we have for this meeting, uh, as well as through any other platform that you may have. So again, thanks everyone, and I appreciate your efforts on behalf of the board and, uh, and, the, and the folks that work with the board. So uh, we will go ahead and shut uh, our 